in just a minute. Uh, first, I want to say this. I want to thank uh, Dan. You do a great job every time you do that. And I appreciate it, brother. Lindsay, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it when you, when you sing or when you lead us in singing. Debbie, it's always a pleasure to be with you when you, pre when you play. Um, it, I can't express it in words adequate enough, but I, I appreciate what you do. Mike, thank you for your prayer. Um, boy, we do need rain, brother. And we can praise the Lord for those kids. But I'm thinking, as I'm watching Wilson, and Wilson, every week he has to prepare a little sermon for the kids. It takes a lot of work. Um, I'm waiting for the, the, the Sunday morning when the kids will bring Wilson candy. <laughs> I think that's only reasonable. What do you think? <laughs> Would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1? We're going to be reading verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from our God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer if we might. Father God, we are so thankful for the encouragement that we receive from your word. And God, we just praise you for who you are. We praise you for the fact that you not only created this world, but in Christ you redeem those who are faithful. And we thank you and praise you for that. And we pray these things in and through Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, last Thursday was um, Veterans Day. That is a very special time. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all the men and women who have served in the armed forces of this country. The church I grew up in, we had a man in that church named Charles Showalter. Charles was on, in World War II, he was on a Navy ship that was hit by a, a kamikaze pilot. And he carried on his body severe burns, scars from those burns on his face down through his body. So every time I would see Charles, I would think about the sacrifice that men and women have to make who serve on behalf of this country in the armed forces. So uh, for those of you who have served, we appreciate your service. Um, now, every time right after we celebrate Veterans Day, you blink and it's Thanksgiving, right? And after that, it's Christmas. Things happen real quickly. So I, I was trying to think, what could I share with you this morning that could really help you to get in a spirit of thanksgiving. And I think this verse does it in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. What's interesting to me is that whenever we do a study, uh, it seems like in the Bible, we, it seems like we quickly skip over the introduction, those first couple verses, to get into the meat of the text. But that introduction is just as inspired as the rest of the text. And if we skip over it, we're missing some very significant words. And I think in particular, uh, words that are going to help us to truly appreciate what it means to be thankful. So this morning, we're going to focus on five key words in those two verses. Now, when Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, um, he is writing to a church that we can read about his experience at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 and 20. Uh, Paul spent a great deal of time there. We know a lot about Ephesus. Ephesus is in what was referred to as Asia Minor. Today, it's modern-day Turkey. And Ephesus was a port city at the time of Paul. It's no longer a port city. Uh, the waters have changed, and it's, so, it's so, uh, some distance from, uh, from Ephesus to the sea. Uh, but at the time of Paul, it was a very important and significant port city. Um, in Ephesus, uh, there are many Roman buildings there that indicate how important this town was in Paul's day. There was a library there. Uh, there was a triumphant arch that was built in, I think, 3 BC. One of the most significant things that you find in Ephesus, though, is a temple to the goddess. This is the Roman name, Diana. But she also goes by the Greek name, Artemis, and by an Asiatic name called Estarte. Now, uh, Artemis was the Greek goddess of the hunt, but Astarte was a mother goddess and a moon goddess. And every year, once a year, they would have this uh, amazing celebration. It was a celebration to Diana of the Ephesians, to Artemis, uh, and it was a celebration that uh, what was involved in that was basically it was a drunken orgy. 
during the time of the celebration. So Paul, when he's proclaiming the, the message of the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he's proclaiming it to these people. Now, there's always two groups of people that follow Paul that are kind of, I would say, more or less his adversaries. There are Jews, uh, sometimes we refer to them as Judaizers, who basically believe in Jesus, but they say, in order for you to be a, a good Christian, you have to first be a good Jew. So you have to practice Jewish orthodoxy, which involves circumcision, strict uh, dietary laws that you find in the book of Leviticus. Now, in, in Acts chapter 15, the, the uh, leaders of the church came together and they settled that issue for Gentiles. Okay, But the Judaizers were still trying to make uh, um, Gentile Christians Jewish first. The second group that were Paul's opponents were the pagans, the idolaters. Hence, you see what's going on in Ephesus when Paul is preaching to uh, a town that highlights Diana of the Ephesians. There were silversmiths in Ephesus that made little images of Diana. And so that was kind of their mainstay because everybody seemed to have one of these little images in their household so that when Paul is proclaiming the message of the gospel, they see it as a threat to their livelihood. So there's a riot that takes place in Ephesus as a result of Paul's preaching. Now, what I want to focus on, those five words, five key words, and I think those five key words can help us to really truly appreciate um, what Thanksgiving is all about. Now, um, it, uh, it, the, the, uh, the significance of these five words are uh, basically, you have to understand this about Paul. Paul's the king of run-on sentences. In fact, you're not going to find a verb in this section until you hit verse 4, okay? But I want you to notice some key words that he uses because he uses the word saints or holy ones sometimes. It's, and, and you have to understand that Paul is going to be writing in Greek, but very often when he's referring to the Old Testament, he is referring to a Greek translation of Hebrew. So what we have to do is we look at these words, we have to understand what the Greek word means, and in background, we have to understand what the Hebrew word means. And we, when we do that, I think we can get a better picture about what Paul's talking about. Now, one of the first things he says, he refers to saints at Ephesus. That is the Greek word uh, hagios, and it is, uh, now, it is an adjective now, from grammar. Do you remember what an adjective does? Okay. Let me give you a little secret. I hated grammar when I was in school. Now, for those of you who are old enough, you remember when you used to, have to get up on the blackboard and diagram sentences? That was painful for me until I started to study other languages. Then I began to understand, okay, this makes sense. I understand why we do that now. But at the time... I hated it, okay? So, uh, he is referring to the Christians at Ephesus. Remember, this is an adjective, and it's applied to the holy ones who are in Ephesus. He's referring to them as holy, or you could refer to that as saints. It could be translated as saints. Now, that's an inter it's an interesting term, because in the Catholic Church, does anyone know what it means to become a saint? You have to go through a process that's called beatification. Okay, what beatification means is they have to be able to attribute at least one miracle to you before you're going to be designated as a saint, canonized as a saint. That is not the Christian concept that we see Paul writing about. Paul is saying that everyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ is a saint, is holy. So what does that word mean? It means that you are set apart but you got to kind of go back into history to appreciate the significance of this word leviticus eleven forty four 44 says this for i am the lord your god consecrate yourselves therefore be holy as i am holy that's a challenge but what stands in the way of being holy as god is holy there's a problem you know what the problem is the little words called sin sin prevents us from being holy. Therefore, we have a problem, but Paul's going to show you God takes care of that problem, and he does that in Jesus Christ. Now, do you remember when God calls Moses, and 
he, he, uh, Moses had that burning bush experience. Remember that? You remember what God says to Moses? He says, Moses, take off your sandals for the ground you are standing on is holy ground. Okay. Now, do you remember when uh, the children of Israel were in the wilderness, on that wilderness journey? And God comes down on Mount Sinai. It, and, and therefore, they refer to Sinai as the holy mountain. Okay. And then after that, uh, God gives the law. Ten Commandments, and you have the Ark of the Covenant, which is in the Holy of Holies, the most holy part in the temple. And the Ark of the Covenant is also sometimes referred to as the mercy seat. It is the place where the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year, sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant to cover the sins of the Israelites. Okay? Um, why does God say to Moses, it's holy ground? Why is Mount Sinai designated as holy? And why is that inner sanctum of the temple considered holy ground? One word, the presence of God. That's why. Now, we cannot stand in the presence of God as sinners. Therefore, we have to have our sins covered by the atoning sacrifice of the Lamb of God, who John says takes away the sin of the world. Remember when Jesus comes to John to be baptized in the River Jordan. What does John say about Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so that allows us who are not holy to wear or to be clothed in the garments of holiness that come from Jesus Christ. So that when Paul is greeting the Christians at Ephesus, he can say to them, you are holy ones of God. Isn't that beautiful? You could say the same thing of the church today. You could say the same thing of this church. Now, if you want a reason for being thankful this year, here's a reason for being thankful. You're holy ones of God. Isn't that neat? That God has covered your sins with the blood of Jesus Christ. That when Jesus was crucified, he enters into the Holy of Holies. Remember, the temple veil is torn from top to bottom, indicating now that access is available to God in Christ. Okay? And what that means is that Jesus is the perfect high priest who enters one time into the Holy Holies with the perfect sacrifice of his own blood. That is what lets you be called holy. Isn't that an amazing thing? Isn't our God amazing? So he not only says that they are holy, but he's also going to say this. He says that they are faithful. Now, this is a Greek word. Here it's pistois, but it comes from a root Greek word, pistes. And when he, when, whenever that term is used, um, it implies at least, I think, it means at least three things. It means, number one, that there is a strong conviction. And in this case, it is a strong conviction about who Jesus Christ is, and what our relationship with Jesus Christ is. So first you have conviction. Then you have surrender to that. It's not just a matter of me knowing about Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ then becomes my Lord. I'm going to spend some time on that term in just a minute. So I have a strong conviction. I surrender to that conviction, and then guess what happens? My life is modified or changed by that conviction. Paul's going to say it this way in Ephesians 4.1. Walk worthy of the calling wherewith you are called. In other words, you are wearing the names of holy ones in Christ. Live in such a way that people can see the dynamic of Jesus Christ. So in a sense, you have both a mission and a message. The mission is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message is Jesus saves. There's a reason for thankfulness. So, not only does it have three meanings, but I think it also implies three very important things. And here's a reason for thanksgiving. It means, or it implies, that you have, in Christ, a forgiven present. Today. Right now. It means that in Christ, you have a forgiven past. There's a reason for celebration. We all have skeletons in the closet. 
that we'd like to remain in the closet. We all realize more than anyone that we're sinners. And we don't want people to know about what we've done because we're not proud of it, okay? But here's the other part. It also means in Christ, you have an optimistic future. That's already, but not yet. One of the terms that Paul's going to use as he's referring to Christians, he's going to say this, that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, this is Ephesians 2, when he died on the cross, God raised him up. But he raised us up with him, and he seated Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. The implication is that we are seated with Jesus in the heavenly places. Already not yet. It's already a present reality, but we haven't taken off the, this old body of flesh yet. So it's already in one sense, but in a futuristic sense, not yet. And that waits to the end of time until we are actually with uh, our Father in heaven. So, um, he says that they're faithful. Then he goes on to give a, a prepositional phrase. What's a prepositional phrase? I hated diagramming these things. Now, you haven't, I don't think, some of you may have seen my written handwriting. If you have, it's terrible. Um, and it was worse then. And, in fact, whenever I teach, they take chalk away from me because I'm dangerous with chalk, okay? Um, uh, so whenever I was trying to diagram sentences and you know how you would put those prepositional phrases in that in that diagram oh, it just drove me crazy what's the purpose of a prepositional phrase it, it's a modifier isn't it so here the the modification or the the term in Christ is a reference to uh, the Ephesian Christians and what God has done for the Ephesian Christians Here's what Paul says in Ephesians 1, 7. In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness, riches of his grace. We can stop right there. That's the reason for Thanksgiving, is it not? The fact that we have our sins forgiven. The fact that we have a Savior, Jesus Christ. The fact that God poured out on him his wrath that we deserved. Christ didn't deserve that. We do, but God poured out on Jesus Christ his wrath in order that we might experience forgiveness and right relationship with God. Now, there's a reason for Thanksgiving. Colossians 1.27, Paul says this. To them, again, this is believers, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is, and here's my title, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay? Um, it's only because of their union with Christ that Paul can address them as saint, set apart, as faithful, and as in Christ. Now, I, I need to back up. That, that term, saint, set apart, it means set apart from something, and it means set apart to something. So you are set apart from that old life sin, and you are set apart to a new life in which you glorify Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. So believers have the permanent indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit seals us for the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30 says it this way. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, what is a seal? A seal is a stamp of authority. Okay? In the ancient world, very often what you would do is you would wear a signet ring. And so when you wanted to put your seal on anything, you would use your signet ring to impress your seal on it. And that would indicate your authority. So what God is doing in Christ, he gives us the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit as a seal, looking forward ultimately, ultimately to the day of redemption. So the Spirit's presence in our heart guarantees our salvation. Now, Jesus speaks about this in John 17, 6. He says, they, 1760, they are not in the world just as I am not of the world. Now, God will continue the work in us until it is finished. That is a term that we refer to theologically as sanctification. 
In other words, we are justified, we are declared legally, forensically, to be forgiven of sin by God, that's justification. And then sanctification is the process by which God makes us what he's declared us to be. He declared us to be righteous in Christ. Sanctification is the process where he is making us to become righteous in Christ. That process does not end until we cross over. So it's kind of an ongoing process of God working in us and working through us. Now, this is a forward-looking guarantee of perfection, and that's what Paul means when he says Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we have three kind of key terms here. We have saints. And by the way, if you are believers in Jesus Christ this morning, you are a saint. Okay? We have saints. We have faithful ones. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you are honoring Jesus Christ with your life, you are a faithful one. But the key is, the focus, it is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so that's the very beginning. And then Paul uses a, he uses a typical salutation. In fact, if you look at Paul's greeting, this is the typical way you would write a Greek letter or a Roman letter. Okay, so you're going to find pretty much the same stuff in his greeting to the Ephesians, is his greeting to the Philippians, to the Galatians. You're going to find a similar structure. That shouldn't surprise us, okay? All right, so then he's going to say in his salutation, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice, joy and peace come from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace are only possible in Jesus Christ. Think about this. As you approach Thanksgiving Day this year, there are a lot of things that could impact and interfere with the spirit of thankfulness. It's been a tough year. This whole COVID thing can impact you in a negative way and cause you not to be as thankful as you need to be. Personal loss, loss of a loved one during this past year can impact us in a, in a sense that we are not as thankful as we need. How about personal health? Suffering from health issues. Uh, that can impact us in a negative way where we are not as thankful. Depression. All those things can influence what we see going on in our, in our country right now politically. Unrest, turmoil, chaos. What's going to happen? We don't know. And in the midst of that, the temptation is not to recognize that God is on his throne. And he is in complete control. So if I have an illness, I know God the Father is on the throne and he cares for me. If I've experienced personal loss this year, I know God the Father is on the throne and he cares for me. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in our country. But I do know this. And here's your reason for thankfulness. God the Father is on the throne. And God will work things out in the way he chooses as he wants to do it in his own time, not mine. Now, that gives me reason for comfort, and it gives me reason for uh, thankfulness. Now, a couple key words here. Notice as he greets them, he greets them with the Greek word grace. That is the Greek word charis. It could be translated as grace. It could be translated as gift. Let me give you an acrostic for that. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace means, okay? Um, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating word, but here's the thing. It means it, it's in a present tense, meaning that it is God's spontaneous, unmerited favor in action right now. Not futuristic. Grace is at this moment in action in Christ Jesus. Uh, this is God's freely bestowed loving kindness and operation, bestowing salvation upon guilt-laden sinners, us, okay? Uh, now, if grace is the fountain, then peace is the stream of the spiritual blessings that flow from the fountain. 
you cannot experience true peace apart from Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You will have momentary moments when you, when you, there's the absence of hostility in some form in your world. But you will not have true peace unless Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Now, uh, let's look at that Greek word peace. And then I want to look at the Hebrew word as well. Peace is the Greek word that is, it's the Greek word erinea. And here's what it means. Think about this. It means all that you need to be happy. Okay? So the question you have to ask then is, what do I need to be happy? I want to submit to you, all you need to really be happy and thankful is Jesus Christ. The rest of the stuff is transitory. King Tut proved that because he left everything behind. So it's not about amassing personal wealth. It's not about creating personal prestige. It is about knowing God in Christ. That is a peace that is not transitory. It is a peace that no one can take away from you. Um, the, the word peace in Hebrew is shalom. So it, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and then it is translated into Greek. So if you look at that term peace in the Old Testament, the Greek term will be Aramaic, the, uh, the Hebrew term is shalom. So if I were to greet you, and it essentially means the same thing. I can use shalom as a greeting, or I can use shalom when we're parting. And I'm saying goodbye, because you say shalom. Uh, if I were to greet you this morning to the men, I would say, mach shalom ha in Hebrew. I don't know if you, you can hear that shalom in there, mach shalom ha. To the ladies, I would say, mach shalom ek. But it has in it that idea of peace. So what I am wishing for you as I greet you or as you leave is that you have God's peace. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Now, there's a reason, my friends, for being thankful. Because God's peace comes from God's grace. It comes from knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Now, Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Philippians 4, 7, Paul says, And that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds of Christ Jesus. In other words, it's difficult to define that peace, but you know it when you experience it. It's hard for me to put it in words, human words, that will fully grasp what that meaning is. But I know it when I see it, and I know it when I experience it. Experience it. The world at large cannot understand its peace because it is spiritually discerned. In fact, in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul's going to say the natural person does not understand the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. So the natural person can see someone who has the peace of Christ they can't understand it, okay? Now, the beauty of grace is this, and here's your reason for thankfulness, is that God not only declares you to be righteous, but he makes you righteous. Grace then produces in the believer's peace the confident expectation, not in us, but in Christ and the Holy Spirit living in us by grace. So what do we see in these two small sentences? We see the amazing work of God's grace in salvation history. Grace in us, great, first of all, grace is, God is the author of grace. God is a God of grace. You cannot have grace apart from God. And grace in us produces peace. Peace only comes from God through Christ in the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believers. So, we are saints, which means you have been de de judicially declared by God. That's a courtroom saying you have been declared not guilty of your sins. That's what justification means at this moment in time. We are faithful. Faithful means we live by faith in Christ Jesus. It means that we trust Jesus Christ supremely and it's demonstrated in our lives and particularly in times 
great difficulty. That should give us comfort as we see what's happening all around us in our modern culture. That should give us comfort as we deal with personal struggles in our lives, as we deal with issues like depression, loss of a loved one, loss of personal health. That should give us comfort because God cares deeply about you and he showed us at the cross. What an amazing thing. We are in Christ. The church is in Christ. The church is the body of Christ. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. Christ in you. The hope of glory. I think Paul addresses this beautifully in, uh, in, Corinthian, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians when he says this. For he, this is, he is God. For he made him, to him is Jesus. For he made him to be sin on our behalf in order that we might become, you ready? The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Saints, holy ones, set apart, pistis, faithful to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In Christ, you put that together and we have grace and peace. So that as we greet one another, as we prepare for Thanksgiving, as we can truly say shalom, we can say Aranea. We can wish you peace, well-being that only comes from God in Christ Jesus. The five words we look at this morning. Ah, I must, no, I need, I need to look at one other thing. Notice what he Paul said. It comes from being in Christ Jesus the Lord. So I need to look at those three words and then we'll close. The word Christ is the uh, Greek word which basically means anointed one. So it's a reference to Messiah. Christos is the Greek word. Um, the word uh, Savior is the Hebrew word Yeshua. Joshua's name means Savior. It means someone who is saving us from the problem of sin. So Christ Jesus, anointed one, Savior, and then the Lord. That's the Greek word Kyrios. In, in, uh, if, I, if I use a small k in Kyrios, it means someone who's in a position of authority. If I use capital K, it means maximum authority okay so christians came to realize there's only one maximum authority and that's god every year if you were a a roman or lived in the roman world every year you were required to burn incense to the emperor in fact roman soldiers would greet each other by saying this um caesar is capital k curious the lord and the response would be yes the lord is caesar christians can't do that because christians recognize Caesar may be in a position of authority, but there's somebody above him. Remember when uh, Jesus took the Roman coin and said, whose inscription on it? Render under Caesar that which is Caesar, and under God that which is God. And everything, including Caesar, belongs to God. So those terms, then, you have to cap that off by saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. If you can say that with sincerity at Thanksgiving, you truly have a reason for celebration and a reason for thanksgiving because Jesus Christ is your Lord, maximum authority in your life. And he gives you grace and he gives you peace. So let's celebrate Thanksgiving this year a little different way where we give God the glory that he alone deserves. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father God, we are so pr grateful for your mercy and your grace. Now, we confess, God, we don't deserve your mercy. We're not worthy of your grace. But, God, we praise you that you make us worthy because of who you are, not who we are. And, Lord, we want to thank you and praise you for the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God, where would we be without you? And so as we take in time to pause and be thankful, God, we are truly thankful for your mercies because they are renewed every morning. And so we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.